the hideous root. A plumber appeared by the light of the moon and sang like the grinding of brakes to his wife, who made answer which, though out of tune and aesthetically full of mistakes, was sweet in his ear, for he knew that it meant she was waiting for him in their wicker-work tent. The plumber, deploying the light of the moon, permitted his body to spring like a leaf in the wind, like a heifer in June, like a fish or a ball on a string. There was joy in his heart, and the prawns in his hair felt the wind in their scales as he leapt through the air. The leap of a plumber in tropical climes is a sight calculated to pluck at the heartstrings of those who, ahead of the times, no skill when they see it from luck. Oh, full of abandon and zest is the sight of a plumber spread-eagled in amorous flight. When the plumber had landed, his echoes had died through the forest, and he was alone with his shadow, his passion, his prawns, and his pride, and his suitcase from Marylebone. Above him the trees with their heliotrope fruit reflected their sheen on his tropical suit. His tropical suit that he made long ago in his bachelor days neath a tree with his needle and cotton a glint in the glow of a sunset that sat on the sea, the suit that enriched seven months of his life in the making thereof for the eye of a wife. And a wife soon enough had landed on the scene. She had watched him one evening of thrills. His suit in the starlight was purple and green and was garnished with tassels and frills. On his shimmering sleeves there were crescents and moons, and his chest was embroidered with knives, forks, and spoons. His collar was seaweed dragged out of the sea, all golden and shiny and wet, his hat was an elephant's ear that could be twisted up like a fresh serviette that is perched on the table when very clean guests are invited to dinner with studs in their vests. Now, that very same evening, the evening she saw him appear in his tropical suit, she had stood silhouetted against the white shore. In her hand was the hideous root. The root but for which he might never have known anything could be worse than the face of his own. But, oh, it was worse. It was worse than a dream of a gargoyle coiled up in a fight with itself whom it bites and decides that each scream is not its by some face in the night. Far worse was this hideous root that she carried at the side of her face, even though she was married. And, oh, to the plumber, as lovely she is as a rose on the brow of a fawn, or a dewdrop that gurgles in aqueous bliss in tremulous light of the dawn, how gorgeous she was, he remembered that day on the sands when he wooed her and took her away. But the root, he had murmured, the root, my most sweet, must it share in our marital life. She had smirked like a fairy and wriggled her feet, then replied, You must know that a wife has her secrets, my dear, and this root is my friend. Be patient with me, though you can't understand. The plumber remembered the pride he had known in taking her into his arms, though she still held the root very close to the bone, which confused the deploy of his charms. But, oh, there was pride in his promise to never refer to the root, though he clutch it for ever. He entered the glade with a bounce of such joy that the serviette hat on his head was blown through the air, though he'd fixed it with glory to his ears, which were lilac and red. It stuck in a tree, and a bird with thick legs jumped inside with a bang, and laid thirty-three eggs. When he came to the wickerwork tent, he gave cry, as before, like the grinding of brakes, and peered through the wickerwork door with one eye to observe the reaction that shakes the frame of a loving and sensitive spouse when the cry of a husband vibrates through the house. 
but oh, the black horror, the sharp disillusion, the grim realistical fact. She was there, it is true, but was coiled in confusion and foiled by lack of his tact. She had not been prepared for his speed, nor before had been caught unawares when he peered through the door. No, never before since that day of all days, when he watched her against the white shore. No, never before since the fire of his praise had scalded her. Never before in his life had he ever had reason to doubt. Oh, where was the root? She was never without. That horrible, desperate ghoul of a root, that nightmare of twitches and twists, that riot of wrinkles from skull-piece to foot, with its surfeit of ankles and fists, that coiling, incurable, nobbled and scarred monstrosity measuring nearly a yard. As he looked through the wickerwork, what should he spy but his wife in a whirlpool of speed? When she stopped to draw breath, he could see with one eye she was very distracted indeed. She had lost her ridiculous root, and he saw that without it, her beauty was never no more. The root which she held in the grip of her paw as a foil to her negative charms, the root that would heave with her every snore as it lay through the night in her arms, all oh, the qualms that now racked him, the root being gone, made hay of his pride in a beauty now flown. For, ah, in her terrible moments of rest, he could see she was frightful. Indeed, the terrible root that had helped to invest her face with the bloom of her breed was missing, and she, being glad of a mate, was searching for it at a hideous rate. The plumber was mortified, hesitant, full of deep terror, but suddenly saw the root on the grass neath the bright tree, and all his confidence flowered once more. He grasped it, and cried to his lady within, Your root, my beloved, your roots in my fire. At the sound like a meteor that streams through a cloud, his mate had burst out of the tent as a knife runs through butter. She sailed with a loud and shattering sound as she went through the wickerwork wall of their dwelling to land by her husband, who held the great root in his hand. She snatched at the hideous root in a wild, unladylike manner, and squeezed the hideous thing in her arms like a child. Beside her, the root, by the rule of stark relativity, lowered the wood o'er the eyes of the plumber, and she was once more an ornament made for his praise. The root with its mystical powers of yore resolved his inelegant ways, and a vision of all that her beauty had been returned to enchant the connubial scene. But now, double padlocked, the jubilant wife of the plumber has chained to her side the hideous root, which she guards with her life. For what can more furnish a bride with tranquillity, faith, and a pride in her lot than a foil of the kind that the lady has got? And from then until now, the thrice halcyon days flow by them, the lady be charmed with the root at her belt, while he floods her with praise in a manner ornate and unharmed. And yet, at the back of his mind sometimes stirs a dislike of that root and that secret of hers. <laughs>